Hey, my Travel Ones podcast today, I'm lucky to have Lucas Hogue. How are you today, Lucas? I'm good, man. How are you? So far, so good, my friend. Appreciate the time. I mean, you're running around as much oh, as you can. Well, yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> Try to stay out there on the road during this whole pandemic thing. It's something we, we strive to do. I, I spent my first week back on the road this week, so it was nice. Oh, nice. So, I was down in Tampa Bay, actually, uh, filming for Hogue Wild, and I was down there for about four days. So it was really great to be out. Yeah, it felt good to get on the plane, probably, huh? Actually, we drove. Oh, did you really? <laughs> nice. I want as much time on the road as I can. <laughs> it, well, that's all I do. So I, I'm mainly, a, a, I drive for, for a living. So I always tell people I drive for a living and do appointments in between. Absolutely. <laughs> kind, kind, kind of life of a singer, too, huh? Oh, absolutely, you know. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Lucas is a a Billboard charting country singer. Uh, Had a a great album called Dirty South a couple years back and has wonderful hits off of it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a fun project to put together. And uh, I like flip flops and bikini tops personally. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, That's that's my song. That was a fun one to do. It was a fun video to put together. We were in uh, Daytona Beach, actually, on that one. And and, uh, when I, I was actually in California doing a tour and it started taking off on like Sirius XM and different radio platforms yeah. and the uh, label said, Hey man, we need you to come to Daytona and shoot this music video real quick so we can get it to CMT and GAC. And I was like, well, can't, can't you do it? In, you know, California. Um, they're like, no, cause you say the sun's coming up out of the blue waves. I'm like, man, can't you just like flip it? <laughs> <laughs> cause I'm like, I'm here. Yeah. They're like, no, I gotta fly. So I flew to Daytona and when I get there, the, uh, uh, producer and, in, and director of the video didn't have any permits to shoot on the beach or the boardwalk or anything. Oh, perfect. So we basically do it all like gorilla style. And we come to the moment where I'm lighting a bonfire on the beach at night, like the last scene. So we waited because we knew that we were probably going to get in trouble. And as soon as we lit the fire, up rolls the game warden on our four wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And she goes, what are you guys doing? And I don't know what came over me, but I said, student film. And she's like, oh, cool. See ya. And just drove off. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, that's a good uh, thing you didn't do that in California because you'd be in big trouble here. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do anything to get you in trouble out there. <laughs> I, I, I have a, 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 a slight personal question to ask you. Do you mind? Sure. Was the Corvette Stingray yours? No. It's a boom, good boom. friend of mine by the name of Danny Simpson. I like, I the, I like was... the Cobra too, but the, the Stingray was like, that was nice. Yeah, it was a great car. Him and his dad actually rebuilt that. And uh, he's had that his entire life. So it was really cool that he, he let me use it for that video. That was in uh, the Boom Boom video, the lyric video. Yeah. So if y'all want to. That's a good song, Old too. Thing. You had a lot of great songs on that album, actually. Thanks, so, man. I'm very proud of that project. It was a lot of hard blood and sweat and tears <laughs> uh, <laughs> to get it out. It's not easy? Just kidding. Oh, God, I wish it was. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, all, all my musician friends are like, really? I'm like, oh, I know, I know. It's well, like, it's great because you'll you'll cut like a hundred songs, right, that you think are amazing, and then you'll end up having to dwindle it, dwindle it, dwindle it until you get to these these specific ten songs that you want to do. <laughs> I was going to ask you, you know, because you 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 really do you have you have some devotional songs on there. Uh, mm-hmm. You you have your your anthems, the boom boom and flip flops. It's kind of you know your your summertime. It, do you do when you made that record? Were you like, "Hey, let's try and appeal appeal to as many different groups as we can," or is it just? How, how do it was you, more like I wanted to appeal to the different styles that I have. Yeah, okay. <laughs> more than anything, um, because you know I grew up in the church, and and um, faith based songs were near and dear to my heart. And you know, one of the first bands I ever played in was a, a worship band called Extreme Devotion, and you know, I love the inspiration songs because so many people can relate to those and no matter what walks of life you're in or something's affecting you. So I try and always do songs like that because they, I mean, they just kind of come naturally to me. Those are songs that kind of come pretty easy to me or the yeah. faith songs. It's the other ones that are, that are harder to write. And, uh, I always say that, uh, it's just, you know, I want to take people on a journey of kind of what I was going through when I was putting this project together too, you know, cause you need to, rely on your faith a little bit to pull you through all these different situations. And sometimes when you're not motivated to uh, get out there and actually yeah. do what you want, do what you're supposed to do, it's like you got to rely on that to pull you through. So, well, Out of all the travels you've done for, for and you, you also did a lot of the, the military uh, tours, 
yeah, playing for the military overseas in, in different countries, not just Iraq and Afghanistan, but different countries as well. Sure. What's the hardest part, or what's the, the part you, you, a lot of fans probably don't get of, of traveling? Um, the hardest part to me is, you know, you've, you've always kind of got to be on. You really don't have any time to yourself. Um, so even when you're traveling across the country, you've always got that end objective. Either it's a show or you got to go do a meet and greet or you got to go do yeah. media. Of some sort. And as soon as you land, it's go, go, go. And traveling takes it out of you, as you know. I mean, yeah. just driving alone, you get to where you're at and you're like, man, I'm going to crash. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and we don't get that luxury. So it's just like always on the gas, always. You know, trying to stay uh, positive, motivated, and, and uh, you know, inspired um, when you're out there doing your stuff. So it's like you always have to put that brave face on, <laughs> even if you're feeling like, oh man, I need to take a nap. See, that's what that's where I, I totally I get along with all my musician friends because I'm the same way. It's like uh, uh, Wednesday of this week, I did a four and a half hour drive to an account, and as soon as you get there, you're like, man, I'm tired. I want to take a break. You know, you just drove for four and a half hours in California. It's that's right. A lot of work. <laughs> and yeah. And then you got to get out and then you got to turn it on for an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> that's Just, right. I mean, you can't go, Oh, drive suck and traffic. I almost hit a car and the cop almost gave me, you know, blah, blah. you can't complain. You can't bitch. You got to be happy faced. So yeah, exactly right, man. I hear you on 100%. that one. What, what, how much, how many countries have you been to? Have you kept count yet? Oh man, I had to stop counting. Um, there'll be times when I'm going overseas to play for the troops that we'll be in a different country. We'll probably visit two to three countries a day sometimes because yeah. over there they're all very close to each other. Um, you know, when we were Iraq, Kuwait, Kosovo, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Kyrgyzstan, a lot of the stands, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stands, pretty much all the stands. <laughs> <laughs> I got the stands down. Right, and then uh, Egypt and South Africa, Af- Northern Africa, Niger. Um, gosh, the list goes on and on and on. It's not bad. Um, for my, it, it's not bad for a kid from the Hubble. I know, right? I mean, gosh, it wasn't that long ago that I'd never even seen the ocean until I moved to Nashville and uh, met my wife, my current wife here now, and and uh, she was like, "You've never seen the ocean?" I'm like, "No, I've just been, you know, I've been landlocked my whole life touring." First thing she does is buy tickets to. To California to go see the ocean. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. My, my family in Ohio, and every time they come out, the first thing my aunt wants to do just take me to the ocean. Right, and like we'll literally, I park next to the ocean. She gets out, takes her shoes off, and walks to the water, and then walks back. That's awesome. I'm like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, you know, I take it for granted. I've lived here you know, forty plus years, so right. It's easy to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you hope you, you try not to. And when I met my my new wife, uh, who didn't live in California, she she made me reappreciate the ocean again. Oh, she, awesome, man! Yeah, because you just kind of look at it and you go, ah, yeah. And then she's like, no, no, that's the ocean. <laughs> like it goes all the right. way. So it's yeah, just that's one my of favorite things. one of my favorite things to do: is be out on the ocean, in the ocean, under the ocean, wherever. Oh, um, it's just a blast. I was going to ask you as, as you know, and I missed you when you were here locally, but how did you like lobstering? Oh God, I love it. Actually, this Monday is the Catalina Island episode. So oh, nice. That was my experience with uh, lobstering. And, um, yeah, I just had a blast. I can't wait to go back and do it. I'm going back in October and I'm actually diving this time for lobster, um, instead of hooping. So I'm excited about it. And, and are you going to bring Ric Flair with you again? Ah, right. Oh my God, that guy's awesome. Adam is a great guy. His wife Jewel is fantastic, and Mike McKnight as well. They're just great, great people. We had a blast, dude. That was so funny. When I was watching the teaser for that episode, I was like, "He does look like Ric Flair, right?" First time I saw him, I was like, "Man, if he was like a few inches taller and like thicker, he would be totally Ric Flair." <laughs> so, so now see, we're, we're, we're teasing the, the the new episode with Ric Flair on it. So right. W- oh, I actually did a podcast last week, and the lady who was interviewing me, she's like, "How was it filming your first episode with Ric Flair?" I was like, "Um, it really wasn't Ric Flair. It was a <laughs> guy that looked a lot like him." <laughs> See, we're going to start that rumor now. Ric Flair's going to want to do your show. Yeah, or he's going to sue me. <laughs> Either or. Either way, you get yeah. press. 
one way or the other. <laughs> you get some press out of it one way. Right. So what, what's the kind of the background on, on the sportsman show Hogue Wild? The Hogue Wild is a show that, you know, I've been trying to put out for, for many years, you know. Obviously, touring around the country, I get to meet so many amazing people yeah. that want to share their lifestyle as I want to share my lifestyle with them. And, and we just hit it off and we keep in touch. And it's always been that outdoor theme that has always, you know, kept our, um, it's kind of in that equality line for us, you know, it's, it's like everybody can talk about the outdoors or have some, some sort of love for the outdoors. And, and, uh, you know, I was like, man, I'm just going to start bringing a camera guy, you know, and start putting these shows together. Cause I feel like my guitar has been my passport for these entire years everywhere I go. So it was really cool when it came about and when sportsman's channel got excited about it too, uh, having their support means the world. So I'm really excited to uh, get it out there and it's really doing great. People are really reacting to it. And I think, you know, my, my thing was I wanted to bring a different, maybe a different audience that might not be watching the sportsman's outdoor channel, things like that. And I feel like it's slowly, slowly becoming that, you know, which is really, really cool. Um, bringing people that wouldn't necessarily watch a hunting, fishing or a lifestyle type of a show and realizing why we do the things we do and, and hopefully, help you change the narrative of hunting and open some of the people's eyes that look down on it in some way. And, and hopefully they'll uh, look at it in a different light now. It's interesting you said all that because we, I, I live in California and I say that with a little bit of regret, but <laughs> um, we, 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 I understand. we just passed some new wonderful laws that uh, are banning animals. And one of them was the uh, caiman. And like the, like Mike the bringing them into the state, yes. Or what? Oh. The skins. You're not allowed to sell anything with the skins of a caiman anymore. Belts, wallets, what? boots, which affects me. Um, but that, now the state of Louisiana, from my understanding, is suing the state of California because obviously Louisiana is the great farm. A lot of the caiman farms are in Louisiana, and absolutely, we actually brought them back from extinction. The farms are the reason they got brought back from extinction or on the getting close to the list of so the farms mm-hmm. are the farmers are like, hold on, we saved this species, yep, and now you're you're banning it, so you yeah. it was one of those ridiculous moments of Calif- being in California. We're also banning um Te- Teju lizard, so why um because we you got to be nice to animals it's it's a whole thing, yeah that's. Uh, and that, I could go down a huge wormhole here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, then, then, you, I think it's western rattles. R- western back rattlesnakes are illegal, but eastern back rattlesnakes are legal. I, it, dude, it's wow. Yeah, it's getting crazy out there. It's a weird world. So, but uh, and so I agree. I mean, I think your show could be that that kind of bridge, you know, to kind of show people that the the plus sides of it and the lifestyle of it. I sure hope so. You know, that's, that's the intent. Um, I want to entertain and, and, you know, show people a different side of things and let them know that, Hey, there's a reason that we do these things. You know, there's a reason that we have to harvest elk and deer and pheasants and quail and all these things so that we can enjoy them for years and years to come. And people look at me crosswise when I, when I tell them that I'm like, yeah, the hunter is the actual conservationist. You the person trying to tell us to never kill another animal or, you know, harvest an animal is not helping that animal at all, you know, because the herds won't ge- regenerate. They'll start getting sicknesses and then they'll kill each other off eventually. So it's just like, you gotta, uh, yeah. And there are good ways to do it. Obviously. I mean, the way, you know, the way we, we called the, the bison 150 years ago was bad, mm-hmm. you know, where we just, yeah, you know, you, you're, you're. No, there's always a group of people. Tens I mean, of thousands, you know, of them, but yeah, yeah. Did, did you hear? Did you hear how the bison got on Catalina? Uh, I I knew about them, but I didn't. I don't know if I know the exact story. No, they were brought over by a movie crew. They wanted to shoot no western movies on the on the other side of the island because it's uninhabited. And so, huh. I forget the it was Columbia or one of the one of the big movie companies brought over bison to to shoot the movie and make it look like a Western. And then when they got done with the movie, they just left the bison there because they didn't have the money to bring them back. 
And then, oh then they just God. started self-populating. Now it's the largest bison herd in California. Oh, I believe it. So, yeah. Amazing. Just random. Yeah, because I think during the whole pandemic when there wasn't, you know, ferries going over, didn't they say all the bison had migrated to the to the, the eastern side and were like hanging out on the beach and stuff? <laughs> exactly. They're like, hey, if the humans aren't going to be around, let's, right. let's uh, check it out. Yeah. I, I mean, cool. a lot of weird stuff like that. But, some yeah. of the some of the places you're going for your show. I mean, I'm looking at Bolivia and New Zealand. Yeah, I mean that's so you're uh, not just going into Mexico or Montana or California or whatever. I mean, how cool? Is, know, we're going. How cool is that? World, it's so cool. So blessed to be able to do this and call it a job. <laughs> you know, uh, we were over in New Zealand uh, filming for an episode over there. Well, actually, two episodes and. Uh, um, as soon as we were coming back was when all this, you know, COVID scare started happening yeah. and they were shutting everything down. You know, so we were very fortunate to be able to get over there and, and get that in the bag. The unfortunate thing about all the travel bans now is the fact that we, we won't be able to go to Bolivia or the Amazon this year or South Africa because uh, those hunts are rapidly approaching when we're supposed to go over there. So Let's we're pivoting and trying to do other things. So. Come back to California. Eh. Just kidding. <laughs> well, actually, I will be in California. Oh, that's right. You um, said you're coming back. October, that lobster dive. Yeah, we're leaving out of Ventura. I'm not exactly sure where we're going. I'm kind of piggybacking on another buddy of mine. Are you going to spearfish them? Uh, yeah, we're diving yeah. and then actually snaring them. We, we have people, a lot of people right off the island, where, uh, the, the point where I live, they'll, they'll go down with their spearfishing. Right I'm sp- excited. I've never done it that way, so be really cool you've never been to la no i've never been i've never done uh lobster that way oh okay okay. yeah i've only done the hooping for lobster which that's awesome because you're allowed seven per day which is really cool and i think if you're diving you only get two correct i'm not yeah and and, yeah and then you still have to i mean what you know it's one thing bringing them up in a hoop and going okay it's big enough another thing yeah you got to make sure before you shoot that it's going to pass yeah, exactly. So that's a little different. Hey, I'll tell you. You yeah. want to hear? You want to hear a crazy story? Love to. Okay. Guys fishing off the end of the pier, in Manhattan Beach, right, just south of Los Angeles Airport, LAX. Mm-hmm. He hooks into a shark. Yeah. It's a it's a four foot five foot shark. He brings it in. He actually walks it all the way up to the beach. You know, walks his his line all the way over, and they bring it up, and he's stoked. He's just like, "Holy crap! I just caught a shark." So they take a picture, and they put it in the, in the local paper here, the Beach Reporter. And then uh, somebody finds out, and they, they, they tell the authorities because it was a great white. Oh, and you're not allowed to catch great whites because they're a protected species. Yeah. And he didn't yeah. know it. he thought it was a mako because it was a he thought it was a, a mature mako because they had the same kind of uh, pointed nose. And so he got jail time <laughs> and a huge fine, oh. all because they took the picture and put it in the local paper. Oh man! So you got to know. Got to know what you're catching. Say that again. Did they harvest the shark or did they throw it back? Oh, it was dead. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, they brought it up yeah. and put it on. You know, and he was posing with it. Oh, gotcha. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, man. And he thought it was a make. So you got to know what you're catching. I was like, ooh. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Going to jail because somebody yeah. took a picture and put it in the local paper. Yep. Everything's got to be done the right way, man. It's kind of the way it is. You know, some of the things I was going to ask you, the, the business side of what you're doing, because, like, I think a lot, especially a lot of your, your fans and people that like your music and, and then watch want to watch the show, they're like, man, what an easy life he's got. Oh, what, what a gig. <laughs> what a gig. He gets to go out and shoot, gun, you know, shoot guns in Montana and Mexico and go on boats and to California. But how much work is behind all of that? Oh, man, I would say for every minute of fun you see, there's probably a hundred hours of work. Yeah. Um, because literally, I mean, I used to be a contractor here in Nashville and I would work, you know, five o'clock in the morning, five thirty at night every day. You know, that was to me, that was hard work. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, I could shut it off and not go back to work till the other till the next day. Yeah. Here it's like you, I work till I go to get up in the morning until I go to bed at night and I do it all every day, every single day. And all that work pays off in the end because you want your, you know, the show to be on TV and be successful, get your sponsors, make all your sponsors happy. Um, 
figure out, you know, your next record, writing songs, producing those songs, getting them on playlists, blah, blah, blah. I mean, everything. I mean, there's just, oh, gosh. It never I ends, right? Cool, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man, it just never ends. But it's great, though. I wouldn't I wouldn't ha- have it any other way because oh. even though it's work, I feel like I, I don't work a day because it, it is what I want to be doing. And I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. Um, but, yeah, it is extremely hard work. It's kind of like my, my, my brother and I, we used to have a finishing company, a carpenting fishing company. So we did doors and windows and trim. Mm-hmm. And different recessions hit and you, you tr- switch gears. And mm-hmm. my, my brother-in-law went and became a fireman. So he's, he's a, a fireman. Uh, he's actually a battalion chief now in for Glendale. And he has a lot of firemen that are coming up that never didn't have a, a real job. And mm-hmm. I, I did air quotes there because I mean, being a fireman is a real job, but it's, kind of not and they they complain and he's like ho ho ho. you guys all need to shut up you guys have it really good you get you got a place to sleep you get good money you got pensions you got health insurance he goes go be a contractor for a couple for a couple days and then go through a recession you have no insurance no pension no nothing so it's just interesting do you think do you appreciate what you have more because of your background Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Because I grew up as you know in a little farming community, you know, doing that and then moving straight to Nashville and you know being a contractor for quite a number of years, having success at that, and being able to use that to uh, springboard my music career, and then finally, it's like everything's a stepping stone, you know, <laughs> to get to where you really want to be, and you just have to appreciate uh, all that you had to go through to get to where you are, you know, because it makes makes that dream even sweeter it's kind of like when chris stapleton gets best new artist and he's been doing it for yeah, a decade right. exactly yeah <laughs> exactly. And what, the one thing yeah. i noticed and another re- reason i was really excited to talk to you was you seem to use um or get ascertained sponsorships for mm-hmm. a lot for a lot of yourself cabela's wrangler you know gopro i mean like big companies and a, i think a lot of ours don't do that yeah um so for me, it's like, I, I don't meet strangers, right? I mean, yeah. I talk to every, I make friends with everybody that, you know, comes my way. Cause I mean, I just like meeting people. Right. Yeah. And I all those relations have become, have come across very organically. You know, like I was performing at a show out in Northern California. It was just me and my guitar playing for probably a couple thousand people. And probably not even that. I think it was actually a smaller show. I think it was maybe 75 people, you know, and uh, afterwards, we got down. We had a nice dinner and stuff. And this little dude sits beside me, with gray hair and little wire glasses. He's like, "Hey, man, that was good music. Where are you from?" I was like, "Well, I'm originally from Nebraska, but I live in Nashville." He's like, "Oh, I'm from Nebraska." Yeah. I said, "Where at?" He said, "Sydney." I was like, "Oh, the home of Cabela's." He's like, "Yeah, I run it." <laughs> I was like, well, you don't say. <laughs> you know, we kept in touch over the years, and and. Uh, and finally one year he was like, man, why don't you send me a proposal? Maybe we can, there's something we can do together. And that's when the sponsorship came about. You know, it was just those things. And then sponsors bring other sponsors and sure. they're wondering, Hey, why are you working with them? And blah, blah, blah. Why don't you work with us too? I was like, okay, cool. You know, <laughs> you know those kinds of things. That's kind of how I met Jeff Chadwick at Wrangler. So I was with them for a number of, well, the Wrangler national Patriot program. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he and I are great, great friends, just a salt of the earth guy, you know? And, um, yeah, just another thing. There's just kind of just friendships that come about and they just happen to be right place at the right time, you know? Do you think that's what it is? Or do you think a little bit is, I mean, there are athletes that are the same way, right? I mean, some athletes don't like doing press and meeting people and talking to people and others are like you and me or just talk to whoever. Yeah, so. it has a lot to do with that too. You know, being personable and being tangible to, to people that want to talk to you directly. Where a lot of the, the artists um, and you know sports uh, figures, or whatever, don't want to have that one-on-one uh, interaction with that sponsor. But I feel like it strengthens that bond with that sponsor. You know, to help you um, easily access them and, and vice versa, where they can make things happen faster. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Totally agree. And your wife has been a little instrumental in a lot of that, right? Oh, absolutely. She's extremely smart and very good at what she does. And she actually has her own company called Artistry Alliances. And, and they actually help other artists 
not just myself, yeah. um, other artists as well, a lot bigger artists than, than me, um, with sponsors and helps actually sponsors and corporations with big events. She's working with NASCAR and Zaxby's Chicken, and I mean, you name it, they've got a roster, she's 100, 100 CEOs deep. <laughs> well, that's that's got to be a huge help. Wait, oh, absolutely. Does she travel with you, or does she stay in Nashville and stay home, or is it a mix? She travels with me when, when I'm out there doing a lot of stuff. She doesn't come on some of the filming uh, for the show, but if we're out there um, touring and doing doing music and concerts and things like that, she'll she'll try to come with me as much as possible because she can do everything from, you know, her laptop and a phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's I, I was going to say, you know, whenever I have to go to my Hawaii accounts, my wife's all of a sudden very available. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but funny, uh, for- <laughs> Rap- Rapid City, South Dakota, or Gillette, Wyoming. She's busy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I'm like, I didn't tell you when I was going to Hawaii. She was, but I'm available. <laughs> okay. So yeah. How, how much of a blessing is it to be able to travel with her? I mean, that's that's huge right now, right? Oh, it really is. You know, having her next to you beside you, it's like bringing home with you. So no matter where you're at, you can be there and not feel like you're away from home. And we don't have kids or anything too, so it's really easy for us, you know, to hang out in places for uh, an extended amount of time. Yeah, that's nice. Do you, do you have you have cats though, right? Oh, we've got cats and dogs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, how do you deal with them? Friend, well, a friend of uh, ours in the neighborhood just stays here at the house and takes go. care of everything when we're gone. That's because uh, we. I have a, my my daughters are older, older now; they're twenty five and twenty six. So, nice living on their own. So now it's nice. I get to travel. My wife's like, "Hey, let's go." It's like, okay, that's great. It's kind of weird. It's like, whoa, <laughs> all right. No soccer games, no no promotions, no birthday parties. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Very uh, cool. What's the what's your favorite place to have visited so far? Gosh, I would have to say the Cayman Islands. Okay. Um, I was down there doing a wreck dive <clears throat> uh, over the Kitty Wake and a bunch of other small little uh, um, man-made reefs, uh, ship sinkings, and and uh, man, the waters are crystal clear, super warm. And I, man, I love scuba diving. It's one of my favorite things to do. So being able to go down there and see just the vast amazingness that that is the ocean, you know, and, and uh, explore all these places and see things that, you know, a lot of people don't get to see. It's really, really cool. Have you been freaked out yet? I'm not. That's not to say that it won't happen. <laughs> but I'm trying to avoid that. Um, I haven't done a night dive yet, so I'm, I'm guessing that's probably going to be where that freak out moment might happen. But um, there's a quarry up here where I do some open water um, dive and I get my uh, uh, higher level training yeah. and stuff like that in there. So uh, we're doing a night dive coming up in August um, for you know training for a master diver and stuff like that. So, nice. Hey, yeah, I, I, I did. Uh, I was snorkeling in La Jolla one time in San Diego, and, <clears throat> and I barracuda came by me oh. and i'm like that looks a lot bigger in person like right. <laughs> and i've caught i've caught barracuda so it's like all right but when it's like i felt like i was the uh the bait you know <laughs> what i mean sure, it's like because you know when you're on the ship and you catch and you bring it up you're like ah when i was down there I was yeah. like, oh yeah we're in their house now <laughs> yeah exactly so i don't yeah. even want to think about the the shark adventure I don't think I would. Yeah, do that. I know that's the thing that would probably freak me out a little bit. You know, is uh, encountering a, a big shark of some kind. Um, we were down in the Caymans, and we got to, you know, there's this place called Stingray City, where it's about it's only about 13, 15 feet down, and we just you know take all of our weights and, and go down and sink and just lay up, basically kneel on the bottom of the ocean floor and start chumming the waters for these stingray. And these stingrays come in and they play with you and they're all over you and it's just really cool, you know. So that that wasn't, you know, a freak out moment at all. But that was really cool to see all these rays. See, and you tell stories like that and that's what people are going to be like, ah, oh, see, he's not even working hard. He's just going out and playing. <laughs> right. They don't know how hard it was to get down there and how to figure out how to make that trip happen without spending a ton of money. <laughs> well, and then, you know, I... I live in LA, so like I see the the movie productions and all that, 
Hey, how many mm-hmm. people are on your crew? Well, you know, we're I'm pretty mean and lean at yeah, this yeah. point. I'll bring at the most I'll bring two camera guys, and one of them is my field producer as well. So, because a lot of these places, like when you're going on a on a hunt or something like that, it's there's not a lot of room thing. or yeah. room for error as well. So you try and keep it pretty small. But then you have do you have an audio guy, or is that one of the camera guys does does all that? He does all that. Yeah. But I would then, like to bring it up. You got to edit it and bring it back. I mean, there's, oh, yeah. there's people involved. Yeah. It takes a lot, a lot to do all of it for sure. Do you, do you have any travel tips? To, like, is there anything that you just do every time you travel? Gosh, every time I I mean, I've been traveling so much. I guess I don't even think about that. Um, uh, I try and travel as light as possible. Um, I really do because obviously checking bags and things like that. I'm, I'm not a very good wait in line kind of guy. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I try and either I try and ship my as much stuff as I need to, to where we're going, if it's possible. And then oh, I try okay. and travel light as possible. Are you so global entry? Yeah. Global entry, TSC yeah. pre, all that stuff. And I think we've got clear too. So if TSC pre isn't working, we go through clear. It's a lifesaver <laughs> though. It. Oh, it is. It really is. Now you don't have to worry about it. I tried. I had to go back home for a family event um, a few weeks ago, and man, I felt like I had my own private jet because there was nobody on the plane at all. Isn't that crazy? I, my neighbors are um, flight attendants for Delta, and they said the same mm-hmm. thing. They were doing just like some of the, the small commuter, uh, like down to San Diego. It'd be like one mm-hmm. guy, two people on it. Wow. Like, Whoa, there's more more attendants than than guests. So, yeah, private plane. Yeah, but, but they're getting hammered Harder. right now. So, right. what do you what what do you what do you uh, project out of what's going on now? I mean, how how do you think it's going to change the music industry? And then, obviously, you know, it's already affected your your travel schedules with with filming. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's already changed the music industry astronomically. Um, uh, you know, people are finding ways to do obviously the live concerts on, you know, streaming services and platforms and things like that and partnering with networks to do, you know, uh, live video events and things like that. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, that being said, I feel like when people start, you know, rising up a little bit and getting fed up with what's happening and are, they're just like, you know, finally realizing that we just can't be shut down like this. Um, I think people are going to come out in the drove when it first concert, you know, totally like agree. real concert comes out. Are but, you, are you um, prepping for that? Or are you just kind of waiting back? No, no, no. We're always prepping, trying to prepare for that day when, okay, we're, we're able to do it because, you know, we're just going to do it at this point, you know, and we're planning for different, you know, drive in events and, and yeah. certain kinds of different concerts that we're trying to come up with uh, that will, you know, still abide by people's social distancing and what they feel like social distancing does for them and, and try and make it all kosher for everybody. Um, but still, I mean, us as musicians, none of us are making any money sitting at home. And we're only spending money <laughs> because we're trying to continue recording music that people are streaming. And, you know, that's not generating a ton of money for the artist either. So it's like you know, the only place that we really make money is when we're on the road. So we're all scrambling, trying to figure out those ways to get out on the road and still stay safe and get people, you know, to come to the shows. And I don't know how many people understand that. I mean, musicians, don't, musicians don't, don't make a lot of money off records anymore. No, not at all. I mean, it's all, all. it's all tour. Yeah. And it, and it boils down to what people are like, well, you can make money on your streams. I'm like, yeah, fractions of cents. It's literally called micro cents. Yeah. You know, those funnel down. But if you don't have the market share in streaming, I mean, I could go on and on and on. You don't really make that much money on streaming, even if you're getting tens of millions of spins. Well, I, I think, because uh, I talked to Cowboy Troy, and, you know, and he turned out with Big and Rich, but it's still, it's like he's selling merch and, you know, what is it like a, a stream? You have to get 10 streams to count as one sale or something like that. Oh no, it's a hundred streams. It's 100, to count okay, as one. Yeah. It might be a thousand now. I mean, it's, it's getting out of hand. So, so I think it was a thousand streams count as one album sale. 
pretty sure. Well, and then you, you've got the musicians, and you, and then you know, like everyone's like, "Oh, so poor Big and Rich, or poor you know Garth Brooks, he's not going to make his millions." It's like, no, it's it's man, the the crew that work on yeah. those. That's all they do. No, you know? nobody thinks about the overhead that goes into that one song, <laughs> yeah. and and everybody that it trickles down to fund their livelihood too. So yeah, I mean, there should be like a documentary or something come out that explains all that i bet it would open a lot of people's eyes and realize oh wow yeah we need to go do some shows <laughs> well I, I talked to chris gratton who's the tour manager um it's what he's done for 35 years he, uh, the, the one he's working with now is justin bieber and mm. they were, bieber was supposed to be on tour from april to september of this year and th- i talked to him a week after he had just laid off 87 people yeah it's tragic man you know and he's just like I don't even know if we're going to start up. So, you know, Beaver 2020 is now Beaver 2021. Yeah. That's what everybody, I mean, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. You know? So we've got, we got, got to figure that one out. So. Yeah. It's rough. And we're all self, definitely self-employed too. So, I mean, that's we're like the, the low man on the totem pole when it comes to anything. <laughs> so it's like. That uh, part I know real well too. I'm an independent contractor. So. See? I'm, yeah. I am definitely, if I don't sell anything, I don't make anything. And, yep. uh, that my, the uh, health insurance that I pay for didn't care that I wasn't able to make any money for th- three or four months. So, yeah, you got to keep paying for everything. What's what other sponsors do you have other than Wrangler? Just kidding. Um, no, I, Wrangler's <laughs> actually not a sponsor. Hey, I, um, I'm I'm just working with the Wrangler National Patriot on program. The tour, yeah, yeah, that, and uh, we're not you know doing a whole lot with that right now either. That was that was our tenth year last year. Um, I, I put on a virtual, you know, Memorial Day concert and they were a uh, part sponsor of that so that we could put it on this year. But, um, I've got lots of great sponsors. So GSM, which is uh, an outdoor, outdoor company, yeah. like umbrella company. Um, they're one of my main sponsors. Um, Hogue actually Hogue grips and knives and tactical gear is a sponsor that just came on actually two days ago. Perfect. I'm very excited. About that one. Um, are you still with Cabela's? The name's spelled different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know a Will Hogue? I do know Will. Okay. Absolutely. He's a great, great talent, man. And uh, when I first moved to town, I was like, no way, somebody else has a name, Hogue, and it's spelled the same. So I went to a show, and I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. And then it was flash forward, like, I don't know, six, eight years, we meet on the red carpet at the ACM Awards for the first time, and we both look at each other and like, the other hog. <laughs> cool. He's like, no, you're the other hog. <laughs> exactly. We both said the other hog. Perfect. Uh, yeah, it was pretty great. I just had somebody ask me that. Like, related to Will Hulk? I'm like, I don't know. I'll ask. So, yeah. And nice. then a couple other sponsors. Um, I guess I think so we're talking with we're talking with a bunch right now, but some of my um, product um, partners. Yeah. Um, are, oh, yes, Ocean Technology Systems. Uh, Sherwood Scuba, Acona Adventures, um, Kanadi Taxidermy. Um, they're great. So, um, are, you still gosh, ho- are you still hooked up with uh, like GoPro or? Yeah. So we're doing a, we're doing a product deal and, and I'm going to doing some of their adventure stuff as well. So I was actually really, <clears throat> that's why I was late, honestly, because I was editing some of the 360 stuff that I took down in Tampa because I want to get them some content. <laughs> that stuff is so cool. <laughs> so I was though. literally working on that stuff. The 360 stuff is awesome. Oh, it really is. I just got the underwater housing for the 362 that will mount on my, my tank. If I'm underwater, so we'll be able to. I was trying to get some of that, some of the, because our, our, we, we sponsor some cowboys. Hunter Cure, two-time world champ steer wrestler, and some, some team ropers. Yeah. And, and I wanted to get them on, like, on their horses, some of the 360 stuff. Oh, totally. And then and do, use that as, as just footage. I thought yeah. it'd be cuz I it's so cool. I don't I still don't figure figure out how they remove the bar out of the the film. I don't get that, but it actually it's all about camera placement. And it, you would think the first time I used it, I thought the camera was supposed to be kind of like pointed at me, you know, so when I had the the bar, but it needs to be pointed completely straight and the lenses need to be looking up and down. And then you can actually remove that bar in post. So you have to remember to move the shadow too, because then you just have a shadow, (laughs) (laughs) the shadow of the bar. That's weird though, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. 
this technology yeah. technology so well hey man I, so what's the what's the the schedule for the for the show on the channel so um episode three will be um coming out on monday um six o'clock uh, central time every monday and then episode four will follow that and then they do a repeat so they'll do uh, three and four, three and four, back to back on consecutive Mondays, and then <clears throat> five and six, and then it will start going into you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten consecutively after that, and then it airs um, throughout the week as well. So, pretty much, just leave it on Sportsman Channel, and you'll find it. Absolutely, man. <laughs> and, and then you got a lot of gear. You got a lot of gear. You know, I'm gonna have to try, try and get some of the hats and the shirts. Oh yeah, I'd love to send you some stuff, man. We got brand new uh, Hogwild merch just showed up last week. Uh, we've got the fishing shirts, we got hunting shirts, and then we got the Hogwild logo shirts and hats and all sorts of great stuff. Yeah, you even got shot glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the after party yeah, or before party. <laughs> oh, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. <laughs> before and after. Party. I don't know if I want that. I don't. I don't know if I want you doing shots before you. You have the. Uh, the BB-less uh, shotgun. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> no shot in the shells. <laughs> That's the only way I'd let you do a drink before we go hunting. <laughs> so, right. Well, I, I really appreciate the time, and I'll make sure hey, to, to get the word out for the show. It's awesome. I appreciate it, man. I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, and uh, Thank you for your time and having me on your show, man. Appreciate it. You got it. Have, have a good time, bud. I appreciate the time. All right. You too, man. Thanks, Lucas. Yes, ma'am.